Greetings of peace, everyone. This is Craig Hotstein from the Department of Sociology at Rice University, and I am humbled and honored to accept this invitation on behalf of the Sir Syed Academy at Aligar Muslim University to say a few words about the life and legacy of Prophet Muhammad based on some of the research that I have carried out over the years. Sir Syed, of course, did plenty of research on the life and legacy of Prophet Muhammad. And interestingly, he had a particular keen interest in what so-called Western scholars had to say about Prophet Muhammad. And there was one book in particular, The Life of Muhammad, written in 1861 by Sir Muir. And Sir Syed read this and was concerned, if not a little disgusted, by what Sir Muir had to say about Prophet Muhammad. In essence, this book, written in 1861, was very negative towards Prophet Muhammad. It was very condescending towards him as well. And Sir Syed felt that there was significant let's say, Western bias in this particular piece of scholarship. Sir Syed felt that there was no objectivity in the explication, the scholarship, and the analysis. This brings us to the larger issue of the body of literature on Prophet Muhammad in the prism of Western scholars. Now, from a personal perspective, I've been studying Muhammad's life for years now, and I think there are generally three categories that we can place Western scholarship broadly in as it pertains to Muhammad's life. The first is a general lack of knowledge that a lot of Westerners, I'm from the United States, so a lot of Americans just don't have any information on the life of the prophet outside of what they see in the media or through a news angle in which a politician said something condescending towards Muhammad. Now this might be broadly understood as ignorance. There is a lack of knowledge on Muhammad's life in the West. So that is clearly a problem. The second category is that there is a lack of, let's say, good knowledge on the prophet's life. So even if a individual, a U.S. citizen, does have some essays or some social media tweets or some books about Muhammad, there could be the issue of the information not being objective, that it might be biased. So in the first category, we had a general lack of knowledge. In the second category, we have a lack of good knowledge, which leads to distrust. And this distrust is largely rooted in misinformation. The third category is a bit more drastic. The third category is that there might be a general apathy towards scholarship relating to Prophet Muhammad's life. And apathy or a general not caring is quite concerning, especially considering the important role that Prophet Muhammad has played throughout history. But it's also concerning given that almost a quarter of the world's population happens to be Muslim. And of course, Muhammad is arguably the most important person in the Islamic tradition. So the apathy, the existence of it, is a great challenge. How can we in the West, and I'm speaking, I guess, as a Westerner here, how can we tap into people's hearts and in their minds to get them in a frame of mind that would encourage more curiosity on Muhammad's life itself? Now, I also want to say uh, that there have been plenty of good. Western books written about Prophet Muhammad.
Muhammad and Sir Syed noted this in a lot of his works because he was so upset of the depiction of Muhammad by Sir William Muir that Sir Syed actually went over to England and got his hands on a bunch of good books written about Muhammad. And Sir Syed referenced a lot of these explications. One was by Thomas Carlyle. And Thomas Carlyle was essentially saying that all of this negativity, uh, misinformation in the body of knowledge around Prophet Muhammad's life was not only inaccurate, but it was also almost like a sin on behalf of Western scholars. How could these Western have scholars abused the prophet and misconstrued his life in so many cruel ways? So Sir Syed did a great service on behalf of not only scholarship, but of humanity to bring to life a lot of the good works that had been written by Western scholars on the life and legacy of prophet. So now that I've laid out a frame of reference in light of these broad categories of Western scholarship on Prophet Muhammad's life, and also in referencing Sir Syed's engagement with these books and with these various Western scholars, let me turn to some of the themes and principles that I've been developing in my own research as it pertains to Prophet Muhammad's life legacy. My last two books have dealt explicitly with Prophet Muhammad's life. In 2020, Blue Dome Press had published one of my books called The Humanity of Muhammad, A Christian View. And then a year later, Hearst and Oxford published a book called People of the Book, Prophet Muhammad's Encounters with Christians. The latter book there was essentially a biography of Muhammad's life told through the prism of his interactions with the Christians around the Arabian Peninsula, which there were many. So there are a few categories or themes I want to point out here. And I think this is important because these themes have largely been understood throughout the world as so-called Western principles or Western values. And my own research has led me to conclude that, in fact, these principles aren't exclusively Western. That, in fact, Muhammad developed and stood for some of these principles long before countries like the United States, my own country, even existed. The first principle is civic nation building. So, a civic nation, in essence, is a nation that is inclusive and that is really open to all people of all different walks of life, regardless of religion, ethnicity, or race. A civic nation is rooted in values, democratic values, egalitarian values that are placed and understood through a constitution. So the rule of law becomes quite important in a civic nation. The opposite of a civic nation is what we might refer to as an ethnic nation or a racial state. The former category of racial state is best exemplified through an entity like Nazi Germany and the Third Reich, where your place in society was ultimately determined the minute you were born. And that is rooted in ancestry and narrow categories of bloodline. So even for me, as an Irish and Italian, I would not be able to belong to Nazi Germany because they had such a narrow view of what a pure supremacist white race was. So Muhammad, in 622, embarked upon this journey of creating a civic nation when he, in the early Ummah, traveled to Medina in 622 to finally resolve a decades-long tribal feud in the city. So you have pagans and Jews and perhaps even Christians warring with one another. They couldn't figure out how to live in peace and to live in harmony. 
So Muhammad gets to Medina, he sits down all of these warring factions, and he asks a question. How can we resolve this? What is the best way of dealing with this diversity? And at the end of all of these diplomatic engagements came the Constitution of Medina. And the Constitution of Medina is a description, an example of a civic nation because it provided freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, the right to own property, the right for religious communities to be sovereign, to be autonomous. And this was critically important because Medina was diverse at the time. So Muhammad creates this constitution in cooperation with this diversity, and it's an amazing document. It even says, in addition to all of these rights granted by the state, that all of the tribes of Medina were mutually dependent upon one another. So if a foreign entity came to Medina and attacked one of the tribes, then the entirety of Medina, everyone who signed up for the constitution, was in fact responsible for defending that Medinese community that has been attacked. Now, some folks might say that this is very, uh, it's a mirror image, let's say, of what we have in my own country, the United States. So let's say hypothetically, Canada went into one of the northern uh, states along the Canadian and American border and came in and attacked American citizens. The other 49 states would be responsible for defending that state. Now, of course, I'm not suggesting that there's any likelihood of Canada embarking upon one of these uh, hypothetical scenarios, but I think it's a good potential example of really outlining and giving you a vision for what Prophet Muhammad had in mind when he was talking about the Ummah. And I mentioned this in my books, which I previously mentioned, the Ummah, I don't think, was just for Muslims. The Ummah was for everyone that believed in similar things that Muslims believed in. And the last thing I want to quickly mention here, uh, and this is the second Western principle, again, People assume that it's a Western principle, but in fact, it's also an Islamic principle, and that is religious pluralism. Now, religious pluralism needs to be distinguished from religious tolerance. If I tolerate you, I'm not really engaging with you. I'm just letting you exist as you are. And religious tolerance is, of course, a good thing, but it's also been described as a principle that actually exacerb exacerbates our divisions because we don't really get to know one another. We just merely tolerate one another. Religious pluralism, on the other hand, is the energetic engagement with religious diversity. And we saw Muhammad engage energetically with religious diversity in Medina, but he also did it again in 630 or 631 when the Christians of Najran came to visit Medina. And we know through early Islamic sources that the Ummah and the Christian guests from Najran had a three-day diplomatic encounter, and they had difficult conversations along the lines of Christology, and the two sides agreed to disagree in a cordial and civil manner, and there's nothing wrong with that. But the pluralism came in when Muhammad opened his doors and allowed the Christians of Najran to actually pray inside Masjid al-Nabawi. Now, this is an extraordinary move, even for today's standards, one might consider it radical. But Muhammad was sending the message that hospitality, treating others how you wish to be treated, the golden rule, is in fact an Islamic principle, in addition to religious pluralism. So I will leave you with those two themes, civic nation building and religious pluralism. Muhammad stood for it. The West has stood for it, despite some occasional faults along the historical line. And we also know that the Islamic tradition and Muslims themselves stand for these values. And I think Sir Syed would recognize the validity 
of these claims, of these arguments, primarily because they are rooted in scholarship. So I thank you very much, Sir Syed Academy, and to all those at Avadar Muslim University. I'm humbled by this invitation. I hope these words were inspiring and fruitful and constructive, and I hope one day to visit you all in India. God bless you, and I'm wishing you all a happy early Ramadan. Thank you.